Welcome to video 5 on our series on quantum field theory and let me start by doing a quick recap of what we were doing um, last time uh, uh, we were trying to uh, use path integrals to quantize the forced harmonic oscillator so this is right here is the Lagrangian of the forced harmonic oscillator and in order to write it in a proper way for for doing um, Gaussian integration I did, this, I did this integration by parts to move the derivative uh, to put all derivatives on the same um, uh, Q and and of course to do that I have assumed here very in a very careless way that somehow I can choose boundary conditions either on on the coordinate or its derivative to make it zero at the edges at the boundaries we'll see this is not so simple but for starters I assumed I could do that and I, and then I got to this uh, this form of of the action right which then I, I used to name this uh, operator right here, which is acting on the coordinates, right? Allowing me to write the generating function as in this way, right? It's just exponential of that action, which I wrote in a uh, convenient way. Then I can use um, Gaussian integral formulas to integrate this uh, uh, generating functional uh, and get this answer so this is a normalization and uh, now I have delta here which is the inverse of that operator so the when I do the Gaussian integral it is essential that I, I I'm able to invert this operator as defined by this equation here and obtain its inverse which is this one right so essentially finding the answer involves uh, the inversion of of this operator right here to get the inverse so far so good until you pay attention you pay attention to the 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 inverse of the operator right, in the green function and 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 realize there's an integration going right through a pole here there's a divergency and that's odd, right? That's not good. We have a singularity here in the path of integration and uh, we should be careful with that. We went as far as, last, last video, we went as far as trying to understand where the singularity can be coming from. And we noticed that the operator I'm inverting, right, the del delta minus one here, actually has zero eigenvalues right these are the eigenvectors that i can use to solve this equation and, and see that they they are there and they are actually the solutions to the harmonic oscillator the free one not, not the forced one right? and and of course these are possible functions in the space of functions where this operator is acting and they are possible functions in the space of functions i'm uh, integrating over with my path integral so there is a problem there because if the operator has zero eigenvalues it's a singular operator I cannot invert it right so I inverted the operator that could not be inverted and so I got an inverse that has singular singularities now so our mission today is is to understand better these singularities and see how they are connected to the boundary conditions because remember I already assumed something about the boundary conditions that might not be true right and how how is the proper way we will try to solve this this problem in a few ways today right with increasing levels of uh, uh, care so that we can look at this problem for from all possible angles because you see that uh, that becomes a, a, a really uh, um, a really relevant uh, uh, detail when we go to field theory so I want to attack it while we're still on quantum mechanics before we go forward let's start by seeing how the boundary conditions can help us uh, tackle this problem 
And, and the first uh, piece of information that we need is that for this equation to have a solution, either one of the boundary conditions meet, must be different from zero. So either Q of some initial time is different from zero or Q of a final time is supposed to be an F is different from zero. Huh? And, and or, right? either one needs to be true, otherwise this has no uh, solutions beside the trivial one, which is just setting this guy to zero. To see that, it's, qu it's quite easy. I just start with a general solution. Let's call this C plus exponential i omega t plus a C minus uh, exponential of minus e omega t, right? And impose boundary conditions, right? So if I demand that Q uh, not, this is the solution, right? Of ti, I forgot the not here, Q not here, Q not here, equal to zero implies that uh, C plus exponential of E omega Ti plus C minus exponential of I omega minus I omega Ti is equal to zero. The other boundary condition, which is Q naught of T final equal to zero, leads us to a very similar equation. but with tf and tf, right? I can actually just add, and uh, first I add these two equations, then I subtract them both and do a little bit of, of uh, algebra, and I can get to the following two conditions. Let me write it down here to have more space, which will be c plus minus c minus, times the sine of omega tf minus plus ti over 2 times the cosine of omega tf minus ti over 2 is 0 and C plus plus C minus cosine of omega Tf plus Ti over 2 cosine of omega tf minus ti is also zero. Notice I'm imposing both conditions at the same time, right? I'm imposing that both the extremes are, are zero at the initial time and at the final time. And so I, I need these two equations to be valid. And also now I'm combining the two to get another two equations here. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I do that, of course, now I can make these trigonometric functions uh, zero by carefully choosing intervals for Ti and Tf. Of course, I can do that. But if I, I want to keep this general, right, and, and, and find solutions for any Ti and any Tf, right, then I need... Uh, I cannot just make the, the trigonometric functions zero because they won't be for generic uh, intervals, right? But what I need is C plus minus C minus and to be zero and C plus plus C minus to be zero. And that implies, of course, if both the sum and the subtraction need to be zero, that C plus is equal to C minus, which is zero. Uh, in other words, I showed that if I, I think if I impose these two boundary conditions at the same time, 
then the only solution is q0 q0 of t is equal to 0 because i i make both coefficients 0 hmm? which proves uh, my initial statement either one of them needs to be different from 0 so that i can have a non trivial solution for any time right? how does that uh, help us right uh, in the following way i can make a change of variables in my path integral now remember that what we are doing is uh, writing a path integral for the exponential of the action in the presence of sources right that's what gives us the forced harmonic oscillator and the path integral is going over all possible shapes of this function q of t right? so a change of variables here uh, can be made by defining uh, q in terms of a q classical, this is CL for classical, and I'm calling this the classical one because I use this in order to obtain this function. I'll, I'll use the principle of extreme action on on that action plus another piece that is actually anything, right? So you, you can see that I'm not losing any generality here because this is just any function q of t. I'm going over all of them uh, in the path integral. This is also any function. So uh, by fixing a part of it and keeping this general, I still can get any function on this side because um, this is anything, still anything. right? And and, 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 I, and I can use this change of variables back into the integral, right? And the point here is that uh, the integration measure here won't change when I do this change of, of uh, integration variables. Uh, this may, may seem a little bit strange, but if you remember the definition of the path integral, this is nothing but the product of many normal integrations right so i have uh, this product in i of many of these uh, um, variables and uh, of course for any of these variables the change is just the same change it's just taking uh, the variable and, and translating it by a constant right this is just the value of this function calculated at a specific time, which is indexed by this index i. So I'm just uh, translating the function by a constant. And then it's obvious to everyone that this is just, for each of these i, this is just the, the um, dq tilde i, right? And, and and, and again, it's the same, right? In a normal integral where I'm calculating areas, this would be just translating the curve and the area keeps the same. In this case, what I'm doing is I'm calculating all the possible curves between two points. This is uh, time and this is qt. Right? So the first integral, I'm just calculating all possible integrals right? and in the second one I subtract um, constant function that can be anything from this right but I still keep now I, I each of these points is subtracted so I, I got new extremes here but I'm still going over all possible function around that one that I now fix instead of doing around here I'm doing it there, it's, it's the same, right? The result of the integral is exactly the same, right? But what's the point of doing this change of variables? Right? Is The point is that I don't know the boundary conditions for this guy. And in fact, I want to keep these boundary conditions free, right? I, I'll have to set these boundary conditions depending on, on the system I'm calculating at the end, right? So I can keep the boundary conditions for this classical one free too, in order to also keep full generality 
and, and choose later whatever boundary conditions are important to my problem. But for this guy, uh, this guy, I can now fix the boundary conditions. I can demand that Q tilde of Ti is equal to Q tilde of Tf, which is zero. Well, notice what I'm doing here. I'm, I'm keeping the generality of, of integration. I'm, I'm allowing uh, the integral to still run over all functions by keeping this guy free, the form of this guy free. And I'm keeping the freedom of choosing boundary conditions by keeping the boundary conditions of this guy now free. So the boundary conditions are free here and not here. They are fixed for this guy. But the shapes of the functions are free here and not here. This guy is fixed by the classical equations of motion. When I make the extreme of this action, I will know this. Uh, and then I will have to choose boundary conditions and solve for Q classical. And and then what what did I gain gain with that? What I gain is that now that this is the the variable being integrated over, if I impose these two boundary conditions, I will fall in this case. So in the space of these functions that are being integrated over now, there is no function that gives me an eigenvalue zero for the operator. Right? And that's the whole point. It's a very smart trick for now. So let's see how that works. Let's go a little bit forward and see how that works. The first step is to rewrite the action in a more convenient way for what we want to do here. So if you remember well, my action is written now in, I mean, schematically this way, right? I have quadratic term of Q, some operator here, calling that operator delta minus one in our case, plus a linear term in in Q with another vector here, in this case, is, is the sources, right? And I have, I did show in the case of when I was doing Gaussian integrals, that if I, lo I know a minimum of this action, right? Uh, I can write the, the action in terms of the minimum. Let's call this minimum Q naught for now. Plus a quadratic term now as I distance myself from that minimum, the Q naught, right? Uh, in other words, I can write it as a distance to the minimum a Q minus Q naught. So we have, we did show this uh, for when we were uh, getting the Gaussian uh, integral, right? This is just a quadratic potential around that minimum, and that is um, uh, the minimum, right? The action calculated at the minimum. Mm -hmm. And of course, this, if I compare this with this part here, I, I see that this is just, again, my action, but now the variable is Q minus Q naught, and there is no source in this part. Right, so remember that this part means the source. This is in the presence of source. This is with the source set to zero. Mm -hmm. So I wrote my initial action as the action on the minimum, and this action in terms of the distance to the minimum, but in the absence of sources. Now let's spe uh, specialize this for the case at hand, right? Uh, in our case here, the minimum is just Q classical by definition, right? The way I define this is taking a stream of this action. Right? So Q0 is Q classical, so I can write S of Q, J, S, uh, S of Q classical in the presence of sources, plus S of Q minus Q classical in the absence of sources. But Q minus Q classical is, according to this equation, is just Q tilde, right? So I can replace this by Q tilde. Hmm? And, and then 
my generating functional becomes just z of j, right? Will be the path integral. Now I'm let's start like this. So the path integral in Q exponential of I S of Q classical J exponential of I S of Q tilde zero which allows me to do directly my change of variables on, on Q because this does not depend on Q and this is already written in terms of Q tilde, right? I can put a tilde here and it's the same integral. Also, Q classical is just a fixed function. In, for the, the path integral, this is the same as a constant. It does not depend on Q tilde. It's independent of Q tilde. So this exponential can go outside the integral. That means this guy comes out here. I have, oops, that's an ugly integral. I have the integral in Q tilde, a, a exponential of I S Q tilde in the absence of sources. Right? Of course, this integral now, it's, uh, we know what it is, right? Is just the exponential of i integral of time right, of um, q tilde of t delta minus 1 there's a half here q tilde of t right, with the very beautiful uh, thing that now I know the boundary conditions for Q tilde. So that inversion that I did, remember to get to this expression, if I, I can even start with the action, not on this form, the full form, right? But when I do the trick that depends on the boundary conditions, now the trick is valid. Right? Let's go back and remember the trick, right? To get to that form, I had to do this integration here, right? This, this uh, integration by by parts here, and 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 I had to assume that this was zero at the extremes at the at the, at the boundaries of the region, which is true now for for Q, Q tilde because Q tilde is zero at the at the, at the two uh, points at the boundaries. That's how I define Q tilde, right? So, for starters, I can do that integration by parts there. Hmm? And, and, and what's more, since it, this guy is zero at the, the edges, right? That means the only solution that satisfy, satisfies uh, this equation, because this is the delta minus one that is appearing down there, acting on the Q tilde. The only solution for this equation is the trivial one. Right? So there's no eigenvectors in the space that I'm covering with this integral that have that 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 has uh, eigenvalue zero. That means I can invert this and solve this integral now, which is the integral that is appearing here. All the problem is now sitting outside. I removed the classical trajectory, which was the one that had eigenvalue zero from the path integral by doing this change of variables. Right? So now I know how to do this integral. It's exactly the integral I did above, but uh, in a well-defined way now, right? With uh, no more... Uh, problems. Of course, now I'll, I'll deal with the result of this integral later, but I don't care too much about what the result is because uh, in the end, this does not, and actually there's a problem here, right? This is zero. Remember, this part does not depend on the source. 
So this part does not depend on the source. So when I make derivatives on the source to get um, correlation functions, this guy will be just a constant. It becomes just a normalization. So in the end, what I'm writing here is that z of j, you know, already when I calculate this integral, there will be normalizations and whatnot. But the integral itself does not matter too much now, the result of it, because I just just have the, my uh, um, generating functional is just S of Q, Q classical in the presence of sources, right? And that's, that's uh, our result. Of course, I have to worry a little bit about the form of Q classical in order to have uh, true answer, which we'll do next. In order to get information about this um, Q classical here, I have to solve um, the equations that I get from the, the ext extremizing this action, right? The equation of motion for this guy is just delta minus one applied to Q classical that is a function of time. And this is to indicate that I'm solving for this guy the equations in the presence of the source, right? Which is equal to i j of t, right? Of course, to solve, I mean, to really solve this equation, I need to give you some uh, boundary conditions, right? But I, I want to avoid that problem a little longer because it's, it's not clear what kind of boundary conditions we have to use here. That's the whole, uh, the whole um, point of we're, we're trying to, to get. But I can find formal solutions to this, right? Just by writing this Q classical of T in the presence of sor sources as the Q classical of T in the absence of sources, so what does that mean? That means I extremize the action uh, without the sources. So it's the same equation here, but with zero on this side. The solution of that would be this guy, right? Plus I delta J of T, right? Uh, now remember, uh, we have to be careful about several things here. So this guy is a function of two times, say a t and a t prime, and j is a function of t prime, and there's an integral here on t prime. That's what this scalar product means. I'll suppress the t prime when that happens. So the result is just a function of t because there's a dependence on t here. I also am again inverting that operator, and it's not clear who delta is. Right, we know that the delta we showed before was um, singular, had problems. So this delta, we have to be more careful about it now because it's acting on Q classical. Right? So we worried about that in a second. But formally, if there's an inverse for this guy, this is a solution because if you plug this up here, this guy, we know that delta minus one acting on Q classical in the absence of sources is zero because that's the equation that defines this guy, right? If I remove the source from here, delta minus one Q classical in the absence of source should be zero. That's the definition of this guy. So, and also these were the eigenvectors that had zero eigenvalue for the operator up there. So we know that this is zero. This is just when delta minus one acting on this guy is zero and delta minus one acting here disappears with the delta and gives us ij. So this is trivially a solution to that equation. I right? just have to replace this by this term on the left side here. You get the right side. Right, so formally, I have a solution, of course. It's no solution until I find this guy, right? And this one. But, but formally, it's there. Now, Let's let's no see, notice the following, right? If I make the functional derivative, and now I'll put a full here that will be uh, 
Uh, I'll explain what that is in a second, right? Of the action. In relation to, again, I put a full here, j of t, what do I get? So, full, what, what the, the full means here? It, the problem in here now is that the action is a function of, of two functions. And q classical depends on j, right? It's over here. So, if I do, uh, this is the equivalent of a total derivative. While so far we have been dealing with uh, partial uh, functional derivatives. Here, here I need to be careful because if I make the derivative in relation to the forms of J, that also changes the forms of Q. So I have to, to write this properly. Right? So this can be written now in terms of the partial derivatives as du Q del s del q, del, uh, del s del q, actually delta s delta q, scalar product of delta q, um, and that is calculated for q equal to q classical, because that's what I had there, and delta q classical in the presence of source over delta j of t, right? And this now we, we need to be careful with the formalism, the notations I'm using. I'm suppressing the time here because there is a time here, there is a time here, and there's an integral in time again, right? Again, I have this t prime here, but I want to. Uh, leave this as a scalar product because it's more clear. But it takes some care to, to notice that when I don't have time here, then I'm a zero or a j here is actually talking about the source. Right? It's either if I see j is because it's the presence of source, if I see zero is in the absence of source, because I'm suppressing the first index because the the final expression does not depend, it's integrated over time. Right? And plus, so this is the partial derivative in Q, and then there's the partial derivative in uh, J of T of S, uh, yeah, which is the same here, Q classical J. Right? Uh, so this is equivalent of the chain rule for, for uh, functional derivatives. Hmm? So this this part of the derivative is easy because this is zero, right? This is the extremizing of the action. We know that Q classical is defined by this is equal to zero. I am extremizing the action in relation to Q for Q equal to Q classical. So this is zero. And this, again, if I differentiate, remember that in the action, I had a term which is QJ. So this is just, and of course, this is S of Q classical, so I'll have a Q classical J. When I differentiate in relation to J, I just get Q classical, right? Of, I don't know, T, because I'm differentiating in relation to T in the presence of sources. This is just Q classical. So what I'm getting here, is that, let me copy this guy down here. What I'm getting is that this is just Q classical um, in the presence of sources. Then again, using my formal solution up there, I can write this as in the absence of sources, the Q classical in the absence of, of, of sources plus I delta J of T. Hmm? And now what I want to do this is to find the primitive of this. So in a way, I'm I'm doing uh, uh, 
integral in j on both sides to find the primitive of this function. The, prim the, 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 the expression which, if I differentiate in relation to j, I get this one. Right? And it's, it's, it's fairly easy to see that this guy will be, I'm looking at here, right? I'm looking here, will be just some, um, of course, if I'm getting the primitive, I, I, I need some constant, which will be just Q, it doesn't matter, right? This is just a number now because this is a function or this will be just a number which can be just you can see that if you put some conditions it will be this right this guy is q classical in the absence of sources remember there's no t means this means source because now there's a product with j so when i differentiate in relation to j i go back there this does not depend on j, so it's zero. And then this term is i over 2 j delta j, right? It's easy to see if I differentiate this in relation to j, there will be the derivative can act here, can act here. You have the same answer anyway, and that solves the factor 2, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm getting the primitive of this equation and there is a constant here. Right? And that I want to use that expression. So using, just to recap, using this formal solution I have here, I'm rewriting the action that is still left on my generating functional. So, so far I had a generating functional that's written up here, this one. So I have this guy, and I'm rewriting this action by using my formal definition. You see, my my, my formal solution. Sorry, right? I'm I'm re rewriting it here. So now the exponential. I, I'll substitute all those guys on this exponential up here. Right? This guy will be just exponential of a constant, which of course I can just including my dump of constants here. I just put a prime, but I won't even care. Right, this guy goes straight, the exponential of i times this goes into this n, which is just some complex number. Right? And the other two terms I can write explicitly. So this will be equal to n. It's not the same n, but I don't care. And Exponential, this term, there's an i here, so it becomes minus half of j delta j, this part here, plus this part here, that is, there's an i there, it, so it becomes i q classical in the absence of sources times the source. Right? So, as you see, I manage to um, rewrite my generating functional. I didn't solve anything yet. I still have this guy here, which I don't know what it is. I still have a... Uh, well, this, this I have more handle on, right? So I, that's the solutions in the absence of source. Those I know. I know the solution for the equations of motion of a harmonic oscillator, a classical harmonic oscillator in the absence of source. Hmm? So already I have some uh, more well-determined quantities here. Hmm? What, what is missing? Well, I need to know this guy, otherwise I'm just bullshitting. If this guy does not exist in, in a sensible way, I'm just doing nothing here. And I, I, I need boundary conditions because it's odd that I'm solving everything without boundary conditions. Just these two things are related. Let's start uh, dealing with um, delta, right? So uh, if you remember well, what we had before is that I found uh, sort of an inverse 
function for delta minus one, which was this. I actually proved that delta minus one applied to this function is delta of t minus t prime, which is, makes it a, a green function of, of delta minus one. But there's there's this singularity, right? Let's solve the singularity for now, and we will understand this prescription uh, soon. Uh, but for now, let's let's solve this by doing what's called the Feynman prescription, right? which is just exchanging omega square by omega square minus i epsilon. So now my tentative uh, solution will be this one, all right? And I'll call this uh, delta f of t, t prime, f for Feynman, and, and, and this is it's called the Feynman prescription. Right? This clearly removes the poles that I have here from the path of integration because it throws the poles into the complex plane and I'm of, of P, and I'm integrating this for real P. Right, so if I do it uh, properly, what what I have now for delta f t t prime, right, is this integral of dp over two pi, and now separate the real part of p. I'm doing the analytic extension of p into the complex plane, and so now I have the real part of p. Real of p t minus t prime i have the exponential of the imaginary part of p i'm taking care of minus i here with the i that was in front of the imaginary part of p t minus t prime over and then i can factor factor these two terms on p plus omega minus i epsilon and p minus omega plus i epsilon. So the epsilon that is here is not the same that is here, right? When I do this, I will have epsilon square, I will have two i epsilon, but epsilon is just a small number. So you could call this epsilon prime and then keep epsilon here, the, the other way around doesn't really matter. Epsilon is a really small, positive, real number. Okay. So, this form of writing this, uh, this uh, delta function uh, makes it very clear that we have uh, poles right now in P, poles in P equal to plus or minus omega minus i epsilon. So the poles are now moved into the complex plane of P. And I have to do the integral now. Uh, and of course, I have to choose a particular path of integration because I'll do this, this integral by resid residues, right? But I, I need it to converge, right? In other words, let me draw the complex plane for P here. So this is real P, this is the imaginary part of P. So the poles are here, omega minus i epsilon, right? or the other one is at minus omega plus i epsilon. Okay, so that are the, those are the two poles. And I want to integrate over here in the real axis, right? I'm integrating for real uh, p. Of course, I have to close this path to do the integral by residues. Right? And I have to decide if I close over the top or if I close 
on the bottom also I, I need to choose the direction here yeah. and what determines the proper way of closing this uh, integral is this part yeah. because I need the let's let's let let me draw here a particular path of integration and let me close uh, like this okay of course I won't be able to draw a proper circle but imagine semicircle that close closes over there and I'm circling this pole in this case right I don't care about this pole okay. I need the integral on the circle, a semicircle part of the curve to go to zero as I go to infinity, right? This, this integral is from minus infinity to plus infinity, right? So I have a very big semicircle. I need this to go to zero, right? The imaginary part of P in this part, in this, in this um, um, part of the plane, is positive. That means for this part of the curve to go to zero, this exponential here needs to be uh, needs to have a negative sign up here, right? So t minus t prime must be smaller than zero. Otherwise, this is a lousy path of integration. I, might, I have to choose another one. Right? But for for this region where t is it's it's smaller than t prime then this is the right path of integration and the integral will be easy to do right I just do by residues this is the residue right and delta f i just have to substitute right i take this uh um this pole away right um actually this one away and and i substitute p for minus omega plus i epsilon everywhere else right? and this will be just 1 over 2 omega right from from down here epsilon of i omega t minus t prime this is after i already take epsilon to zero too right so I'm, I, I don't care about epsilon anymore because it disappears right on the flip side i need to do know what to do when t is bigger than t prime right? in this case the proper thing to do is to close on the other side so let me try that so I'll keep I'll keep the same direction of integration here and then I need to close a semicircle that goes all the way here in this case t minus t prime is bigger than zero so this part is positive but the imaginary part of p is negative is negative which is good because again i have exponential suppression and the circle the the part of the integral uh, that comes from the, this uh, semicircle goes to zero and the integral over the whole closed path will be just the the integral over the real part. I, I'm I'm circling it the wrong way here, so I, there's a negative sign. Right? I have to keep that in mind, uh, but that's fine. Uh, when I do the residues there, I get that f delta f of t t prime is just one over two omega exponential of minus i omega t minus t prime. Right? And I can put these two expressions together, right? Because I, I can get a general uh, answer for delta f now, which is this delta f is equal to 1 over 2 omega exponential of minus e omega absolute value of t minus t prime, right? Because that leads there when t is minus t prime is smaller than zero and leads here. The other way around so I have the general solution right here now that we have a proper uh, inverse 
for this uh, function, right? We have this uh, delta Feynman here. Let's see what kind of uh, boundary conditions for the, the evolution, I mean, for, for the coordinates, um, can be consistent with, uh, with that uh, delta function. Right? Um, for that, let's go back to the equation for uh, the classical solutions, which was that delta minus 1 of Q L of Q classical of T in the presence of sources should be I times the source. Right? And of course, now just being explicit, this is just del 2 del T2 plus omega square, omega square Q classical of T j equals i j right remembering that we had um, that this is delta minus 1 right delta minus 1 and we we have shown that um, delta minus 1 applied to i dp integral of dp two over 2 pi exponential of minus i p t minus t prime uh, p square minus omega square plus i epsilon is just delta of t minus t prime right this epsilon does not change we have shown this without the i epsilon here but of course once i apply this there i can take the limit that i epsilon goes to zero the two cancel out and and you have the delta right so th this is still true right we know that a particular solution to this equation will be uh, q classical t j is equal to i d t prime delta f t minus t prime j t prime right this is this is not the most general solution right what's missing here outside the integral is just q classical of t in the absence of sources this is the most general thing that we show up there in fact that was our formal solution now i'm taking a particular one and we'll see soon enough what how why i can do that why this is consistent to just ignore the classical one in the absence of sources and so this is the solution right if i plug it here these will act in here will give me a delta and then i just integrate and just integrate on t prime and get ij now to solve this is it's, it's quite hard even if i just plug the expression for the delta that i have here right in there for any generic j is it's quite complicated that will depend of course in the form of j right this integral can even diverge depending on how j behaves for for times uh, big times in the future in the past you know it depends on j a lot but there's a class of solutions that i can can attack without knowing j which are those for which j goes to zero when uh, t goes to plus um, t goes to plus or minus infinity so what i imagine here is a system in which j acts for some time but if you go too far in the future or the past then there's no sources anymore the sources are gone right this will be very relevant for scattering in particle physics as we shall see but for now i'm just imagining that whatever is causing this external force on the on the um, oscillator does not last forever right in that case i can take this uh, solution forward Right? Just exchanging the integral in 
sj is contained to a certain um, uh, it's localized in time right i can make exchange this integral that was from minus infinity to plus infinity for an integral over uh, a slice of time right just from minus capital t to capital t right if t all, all I have to guarantee is that capital T minus capital T is smaller than when J goes to zero and big capital T happens after J is already zero, right? Any, the, the point here is that these are finite numbers and that J is equals uh, zero outside this region. Hmm? Then I can solve... Uh, the integral for the two limits, right? So I can take when t, t goes to plus infinity, right? Then this uh, Q classical up here will just be the integral from minus t to plus t, right? And of course, since t is going to plus infinity, the solution I have. Uh, for this, well, this is my delta f. So, for t going to plus infinity, this is bigger than this, and the solution is just the exponential of minus i omega t minus t prime, hmm? which I can um, organize in the following way. Right? This is just. Uh, uh, t integral in t prime, so the exponential in minus i omega t can be taken outside the integral exponential of minus i omega t, right? And I can leave inside the integral the other the other exponential, which will be i e omega t prime over two omega that comes from here j of uh, t prime j of three t prime now with with finite uh, integral limits this is just an oscillatory function this is a positive number and this guy it's, it's just a function that is limited within that region I know this is just a complex number. I can even include this i in it, right? Uh, and and write that this is just a exponential of minus, minus i omega t. So that's how the classical solution will behave for uh, big times. I can do the same for negative times, right? For for the past. If I go into the past, same logic, right? Let me remove this. If I go into the past, I have the same logic. So Q classical of T J, right? Uh, will be very similar. But now I, since uh, T is minus infinity, it's automatically smaller than this guy that I'm integrating only in this region. Right? So I, I I exchange the sign. So now I have I exponential of plus i omega out here t t minus capital t plus capital t dt prime exponential of minus i omega t prime to omega j of t prime of course i need to know j to integrate this but it doesn't matter it's just some uh, complex number exponential of i omega T, right? So now what I'm seeing is that the Feynman prescription that I used up there, right? I, I used a Feynman prescription and I'm seeing that that prescription is consistent with one, assuming that this j of t goes to zero and two, that the boundary conditions are uh, these two.
So this negative exponential, when you go to plus infinity, and this positive one when you go to the past. Right? Pay attention to these expressions because we'll come back later when we finally go into fields and this will be very important uh, for us. Right? So these are boundary conditions that used here will lead us into the Feynman prescription, right? Because uh, you, the signs on the exponential are coming directly from the way I I have uh, avoided those poles in in the in, in the integral, right? In delta. Hmm? Also, when you look at this, you understand why I could uh, remove uh, the the classical solution in absence of fonts here, because if I put it here, right? If I put this here, right? It goes into the in the solution, but if I I need those boundary conditions to be consistent with the Feynman prescription for this part that involves the source, that also means that when I impose those, right, on the classical solution without sources, that is generally just this, one of the solutions will demand uh, that uh, C minus is zero, and the other one will demand that C plus is zero, right? And so this, this whole thing is zero, right? So once I impose those, those two conditions, actually this, this will only give me the trivial solution and I, 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 I have um, the most general solution with those boundary conditions to be this one, right? So this is the solution, which is consistent with having a non-singular operator, right? Or, or the, the, uh, a properly defined inverse of that operator, right? Again, it's clear that with these boundary conditions, I'm, I'm removing the vectors that cause the problem in the first place, which are the solutions for the classical uh, oscillator in the absence of sources. Right? Of course, an oscillator that starts with a certain sign of this exponential minus infinity cannot change it to plus infinity. You need a source in the middle to do something, right? So uh, that's the boundary condition. Okay, so it seems like we have a consistent picture. I mean, at least a complete picture. But there's still a few, quite a few ad hoc things that showed up in the middle, right? So suddenly I had a prescription on how to fix the uh, the problem with the poles in the path of integration for for P, right? And, and then trying to show what kind of uh, um, boundary conditions were consistent with that prescription. I also had to introduce a new hypothesis, which is that the sources go to zero at infinity. And that was not exactly clear what's the relation with that hypothesis with the prescription. Right? So there was, I, I, in the end, I found something that was consistent. I have some boundary conditions that I know that if I impose them, I get something which is consistent with the prescription, but it still feels odd, right? There was a lot of things that was were put by hand, and it's not clear, or at least I didn't show that that this is general, right? That's the only way of doing it. Uh, and, and the good news is we can do better. Right, we can do better, but for that we need to to do a different treatment of uh, of the harmonic oscillator, which is uh, uh, consists in introducing the harmonic phase space. So we will change our path integral from the usual phase space, which is in momenta, to to a, a different one, and and let's see how. So I start here with uh, the usual. Um, the usual 
harmonic oscillator story, right? We have P and Q, we can change, exchange P and Q for A and A dagger, which can be written like this if I want time evolution of them. And of course, once I quantize, I get a Hamiltonian that is uh, like this one already normal ordered, right? And then the Hilbert space I use to work with this theory is usually the Fox space, which is the space of the eigenvectors of this number operator right here, right? That defines a vacuum. And then I can write any uh, Fox space state just acting with the creation uh, operator a number of times on the vacuum, right? So I can get uh, uh, any state populated with a number n of excitations, right? And this operator uh, counts it. Uh, so what I will do now is def define a different set of states. So instead of working on Fox space, we'll work on the space of the coherent states, which are defined like this. So now I'm defining a state that is obtaining, acting on the same vacuum, right? This is the same vacuum that I have there, but I act with this exponential of the creator, the, cre um, the creation operator, right? A dagger, right? Of course, this exponential is just defined as a sum over powers of A dagger. And fr from that alone, you see that this is not, there's no defined number of excitations here. This is not an eigen vector of the number operator. So the number of excitations is not fixed on these states, right? What are they then, right? So for now it's just definition, but let's let's take a look at the properties of these, of these guys, right? So the first one I want to show is what happens if I act with the uh, annihilation operator on this uh, coherent state, right? So just using the definition of coherent state, I get the exponential alpha a dagger, a dagger acting on zero, right? I can add another piece here just to help me, which is the exponential of alpha a dagger a acting on zero, because a acting on zero, I'm missing a lot of operator symbols here. Uh, a acting on zero is zero, so I'm just adding up zero here. Okay? So this is equal to the commutator between a and the exponential of alpha a dagger acting on zero. Okay? So now let's take a look at this um, commutator because I, I, I can I can put this commutator on a better uh, way, right? So I'm interested in the commutator of A with the exponential of alpha A dagger, dagger. So I will expand this uh, as a sum and, and use properties of the commutator, right? So the property I want to use is that a commutator of one operator with a product will be the commutator of with each member, right? A, B, C, D, plus B, A, C, D, plus so on, right? A, B, commutator uh, of A with D, right? So I'm using that here, but I have an infinite sum on this side. So this will be the, just the sum right, for n bigger than one, because of course, for, for the first term, I just have the number one here, right? The, just the identity and the commutator of a dagger with the identity is zero, 
So the first term goes away. I have to start on the second one, right? Of alpha n uh, over factorial of n times a bunch of commutators. So these will be the first term on this whole product. I have a product of a lot of a daggers in any of these terms, right? The first term will be just a, a dagger times a dagger to the power n minus 1 plus a dagger a commutator of a with a dagger a dagger to the power n minus 2 and that goes all the way to the last term that has so the number of a daggers to the right of the commutator goes down the number to the left goes up and and I get to the end to a dagger n minus 1 um, commutator Right, this is just what happens, right? But these commutators are really easy, right? These are just one, one, all of them. Well, just a bunch of number ones, right? In fact, n number ones. So there's a factor n here that will uh, have some constellation with this factorial, right? And I get the sum for n bigger than 1 of alpha n now is n minus 1 factorial because of the multiplicity of equal terms here a dagger of course it always I always end up with the same power of a dagger right which is n minus 1 right this is again the definition of exponential. I just have one too many alphas here, right? There's an extra alpha here that I have to move outside. And then this is again the exponential. So I move the alpha outside. Uh, this becomes alpha minus 1. And then I just have to exchange n minus 1 by n and start the count from 0 again. I get the exponential. Right? So I got exponential again with the extra alpha term. If I go back up here with that result, right, the conclusion is that acting with A on alpha just gives me alpha A, um, uh, the exponential of alpha A dagger acting on zero and this is again just alpha so here's the conclusion right that's the important thing i wanted to show which is that this uh, coherent uh, states are just uh, eigenvectors of the annihilation operator, right? Of A with eigenvalue alpha, which is in the definition, right? That's called, that's why I label them alpha. Hmm? By the same token, I could have done all of these to the left, and ha I could have defined the state which I call alpha star because I'm, I'm I'm letting alpha be a complex number if if it needs be right I could define this guy as just the exponential now of alpha star a instead of a dagger that defines this other coherent state to the left now right and this guy 
doing a completely analogous calculation will behave as an eigenvector of a dagger but acting to the left with eigenvalue alpha star right so i want to save these two properties and i defined two sets of coherent states right that this is the eigenvectors of a and th those are the eigen i mean the eigenvectors to the left of a dagger right so why are, are those guys um, useful huh? let's see some some more properties of them uh, and then we can we can bring them back into the Hamiltonian to see what happens. First, let's notice that the normalization of these guys is not trivial. Right, so if I, I, I take this uh, product, I can use this definition, this, this one, to write this as vacuum exponential of alpha star a which then can act on alpha but i know that alpha is a eigenvector of a right so i can replace up here the operator a because of this property right by alpha that means the exponential can come outside Star alpha times zero, the bracket of zero with this coherent state alpha. Right? And this I can also figure out quite easily because I just use the definition of this guy, which is the exponential of alpha a dagger acting on zero. Right? And this exponential I can expand on one plus a lot of numbers but essentially powers of alpha dagger right with coefficients here but all a daggers when they act to the left they are zero right because there will be a creation operator acting to the left on the vacuum they that's just zero the only term of the exponential that survive, survives is the identity so this is just the normalization of the vacuum which is one i'm assuming the vacuum is normalized right that means this number is just number one and the normalization of these uh, brackets will be the exponential of uh, alpha star alpha right which is not the way we usually normalize things but that's the useful one if you want to keep the proper normalization of the vacuum right? that also means the identity or uh, the completeness relation for these uh, states is not trivial so the identity will be written as the integral over the two uh, both alpha and alpha star the eigenvalues right over 2 pi i that's just a normalization and this is new because uh, to compensate for that right alpha alpha star So this is the identity. I won't prove it, but I'll put it on the exercises for you to do it. Right? You can can prove this. It's not that hard. Okay. Now I use these states to to do my path integral. Right? So now I'm interested uh, in a transition between states, which are these. Right, so now I put just alpha star at time t prime and start with alpha at t become 
more clear later why I want to do this. And this I will write as a path integral. So I start again with the moving frame. Remember, moving frame means these these two um, states here. I are are states in the Heisenberg picture, right? So they are they are not evolving in time. This uh, time here is just a label that tells me when they were eigenvectors of the operators they are eigenvectors of. So this is for a, right? But a is evolving in time. So this this operator was an eigenvector of this. The, this state is, was an eigenvector of this operator at time t. But after that, this evolves and at time, any other time, they are not eigenvector, uh, they are not uh, eigenvectors of the operator anymore because the operator is evolving. Right? And then I can, I can translate that to the Schrodinger picture where the states evolve. Right, so I, when I'm not indicating these, I could indicate like that, but you know, the more confusing the the, the notation, the better. <laughs> so this is just shredding. So these guys now evolve in time. So this is a function of time, right? And we know in the middle what shows up is the Hamiltonian of t prime minus t alpha so now i mean the schrodinger picture so that this is the same thing we did uh back when we were using uh coordinates here right now we, we're more interested in the this harmonic uh, these coherent states because they'll they'll make some very subtle things clear right? especially the boundary conditions Right. So let's move forward. What I want now is to write this Hamiltonian in a way that helps to do the path integral now that I am using these coherent states. Right. The Hamiltonian as and also I mean to, to continue the discu discussion we had before I want uh, a forced harmonic oscillator. So the Hamiltonian I have up to now is just omega a dagger a right but i will add to the hamiltonian a term which is minus q j right this is the source the yeah so uh of course i can change to the a and dagger just using the definition of q in terms of a and a dagger so that will be just one over square root of two omega j a plus j a dagger. All right. So this is my Hamiltonian now for for the forced harmon forced harmonic oscillator in terms of a and a dagger. I'll just absorb this 1 over 2 omega with j here and define uh, these different source that we'll call just j of t over square root of 2 omega and rewrite my Hamiltonian now in terms of that. So the Hamiltonian I'll use at the end will be this one. And the time dependence, I'm leaving it here, but that depends on which picture we are. We mostly work on the Schrodinger picture, so that, and then the operators and stuff that I'm returning is not depending on time. Also, here I'll do something that is just to keep um, uh, good notation for the future, which is this, right? In this case, this guy is just a real function, 
and that means gamma t and gamma t bar uh, gamma bar t are the same so in this case makes no sense to put that bar here but i'll keep it here because we'll see when we get to fermionic fields that we have two different sources we'll get to that later and i want to keep the notation here because then most of the the um, equations that we get here will be useful even when we have more than one source All right so for now this is just just excess notation as far as we are concerned for this calculation they are the same right and there i have a yeah, so that's the hamiltonian i'll be using for the the rest of the calculation if i put this hamiltonian between two states say alpha star h a dagger a t and say beta just to highlight the fact that this number does not need to be the complex conjugate of that one right then uh, we know that I can do the equivalent of value ordering. Remember when I try to apply a Hamiltonian between uh, states of the momenta and uh, eigen, eigenvectors of momenta and position. This is similar, right? I have to value order A's and A daggers in here, right? But then if I apply it uh, to both sides, I can exchange A dagger by alpha and a by beta right and take the hamiltonian outside the the bracket like these right it will be the hamiltonian of alpha star beta time right uh, multiply by alpha star beta which then is just the exponential given by the normalization which is I just repeat this of a star beta t exponential of alpha star beta. Hmm? So I can actually act with the Hamiltonian on these two states uh, and get it out of of this sandwich of states, which is which which is not true for. Uh, terms of sources right uh, it was not true if i used uh, sorry if i used fox states uh, for a hamiltonian that has sources because sources would mix uh, different levels they create uh, excitations or destroy excitations right so this is this is a good point that's why we are going to this uh, coherent states they allow us to use the Hamiltonian resources and still get uh, exchange the, the operators by eigenvalues and then we can go and do the path integral so I'll start from this element here and start inserting these identities right I'll just slice this guy into many time slices and keep inserting these identities right here right to to make the path integral in this case it will be a more a little bit more complicated for each insertion of these i get two integrals instead of one then i have infinite number of integrals but i also get an extra exponential that was not, not there before right so let's see how that looks so now my f of alpha star t prime alpha t will be just a bunch of integrals and here's the product of integrals i'll use i to count them they go from one to n right um for each insertion i get integral in alpha of ti i integral in alpha star of ti 
I get a factor 2 pi i, we have 2 pi i to the n, and I also have this exponential that comes from the identity alpha star ti alpha of ti, these are all the times I inserted. Hmm? And again, for each insertion, I'll get a term that looks like this one, right? I'll have the initial one, the final one, but many intermediate uh, brackets like this. I'll write them all in this way. And the difference between two neighboring times will be epsilon, again, like I did in the case I was doing uh, the path integral in the momentum. So now I have a bunch of brackets that look just like this one. Alpha star of t prime. I went to the Schrodinger picture here, right? Exponential minus, minus i epsilon Hamiltonian. Alpha of t n. I have n intermediate times inserted. Then comes an alpha star of tn, and it goes on all the way to the alpha star of t1 exponential minus i epsilon Hamiltonian alpha right let me put this on the corner here looks less ugly all right so i have a lot of these states and there is this product of integral these uh, brackets are easy to to calculate because of these right so alpha star they always look like alpha star of t i plus 1. There's, the time here is always a little bigger than here. right? So, epsilon of minus i, epsilon, exponential of minus, minus i, epsilon Hamiltonian, alpha of t i. Right? I can, since epsilon is, is small, I can expand this exponential and stop on the linear term on on, on, on the Hamiltonian, I don't have to care about the quadratic ones, right? Use this property. So essentially, I just exchange the operators in here by the values on the left and on the right, on the left for A dagger and on the right for A, right? and then reconstruct the exponential again. So this will be, this part will be just the exponential minus i epsilon the Hamiltonian now not the operator but the function that depends on alpha star of t i plus 1 alpha of t i t i and then once I remove this exponential from this bracket, the bracket itself is just the normalization. It's just exponential now of alpha star ti plus 1 alpha ti. Notice that this is a little bit different from this one, right? Because this one came from the identity, so the two times are the same. This one came from this bracket, so the time is different, right? That, will, that won't be important once I, I take the slice into infinity. This time will be basically the same as this one, but for now, let's, let's be careful and carry that forward. Hmm? So now I, I have to go with this expression. Let me just highlight it let me see here and I need to put this expression 
in here, right? I need to substitute each of these terms by something like that. So I'll have basically for each term in my product, I'll have three exponentials, this one, one like this, and one like this. F is then F of alpha star T prime alpha T is just um, the integrals, which I'll just repeat up to this point. Let me make it small so we can focus on the part that matters right now. So that's the same integrals. And now the exponentials, right? Let me take the exponential coming from the Hamiltonian first. It's just the exponential of I'm I'm I have a product of many of these exponentials, so I'm just writing the exponential of the sum from i uh, to n um, epsilon h of this um, alpha star let me t i plus one alpha t i ti. ti. Right, so this is just the sum of all those terms. How many of those terms? This is important, right? I, I, I inserted n intermediate uh, slices. So there's n uh, integrals and n of this exponential. But the other ones, not, right? Because besides everything that, that, that I inserted, there was also one bracket already at the start, right? And so this one has, I, I can either go from i equal 1 to n plus 1, but or i equals 0 to n, right? It's the same. The important thing is there's one extra term. And the way I, I'm numbering things here is, is consistent with i equals 0. So there's one more term in this sum than the one, the equivalent one for for these guys or or this one, right? And now I have to group these exponentials and these ones, right? And those are just the first one I'll put below, just to keep them together. So let's take first this one. As I said, in this case, it goes from i equal 1 to n right, of minus alpha star ti alpha ti. And the exponentials coming from here, I'll group here. Now the sum is just like this one, because again, there was one more bracket, and these are alpha star ti plus 1, alpha ti. There are also different times, while well, here is the same. So this is the expression for my f, which is getting quite big, All right? Now pay attention to these exponentials in, in particular, right? The, this sum will be, let me put that in yellow just to highlight it, so that many of these terms will form uh, derivatives. But not all, not all, right? That's the main point, right? So take the first uh, term here, the i equal n, right? T n plus one is actually t prime, right? So the f the first term, I mean, the the last one in the sum, is 
alpha star t n plus one, which is just t prime is the last time right when I end my trajectories times alpha t n. So this is the last term in this sum, which I can group with the last one in this one, which will be alpha star t n alpha t n. Remember, the same way, same way I did with the momenta, this thing I can organize as um, alpha star t prime minus alpha star t n multiply by alpha t n and multiply and divide by epsilon because then when I make epsilon go to zero this epsilon together with the sum we have many terms like these right will become an integral here this will be the dt and this will be just the derivative of alpha this alpha star this will be alpha star dot of t right? when I transform these sums into integrals the thing is, and I have many of these, right? So if I, I, I go forward, let me, we don't need this for now. If I go forward, the next term here will be alpha star tn alpha tn minus one. And the next term here will be alpha star tn alpha tn. It's the same thing. Right, but as I go forward in the end, right, there'll be a leftover guy because you see, I'm taking one guy here, one there, one here, one there, one here, one there. But in the end, when I get to i equals zero on the side, there's no one here, there's no i equals zero term here. So in the end, I left over. There's a leftover term, which is for i equals zero, just t1 alpha t0, which is t, right? t0 is the initial time for my uh, f. So this, this guy is a uh, leftover of the leftover term. I, I couldn't group this guy as a derivative. Huh? Other than that, it's very similar to what we had in the momentum path integral. So f of alpha star t prime alpha t will just be, now I have this integrals I'm again including 2 pi i to some power inside the definitions of the path integral so with the path integral in alpha the path integral in alpha star exponential of i integral the integral are these sums that are becoming integrals right the integral from t to t prime the tau, this tau is just for differentiating from t, but it's still the time, right? Of, so terms like these, right? Taking one from each side will be just alpha dot star of tau over i. That's just because these guys had no i in front, so I multiplied and divide by i alpha tau minus h so that's just the Hamiltonian becoming an integral right minus i is here and h and this is d tau and this is the integral <clears throat> but then I have this leftover term which is not in the integral it's just a sum over many these so it's just alpha star 
And of course, T1 and T become the same once I go to the continuum limit. And that becomes alpha star of T, alpha of T. Calculated at the final point of the trajectory, right? This is calculated at the point, not to be confused with tau that is covering the whole way between T and T prime. This is a fixed time, right? Uh, and this is the expression for f. Right, so now we found a path integral formulation in this harmonic phase space, which is this, this space of these uh, coherent states. And let me put a box around this. Because that's an important uh, expression. We have so far uh, obtained the expression for this uh, propagator in terms of these uh, coherent state variables here, right? These functions alpha of t and alpha star of t. But so far we haven't dealt with the boundary condition issue, which I promise would be the point of doing this, and nor, nor the, the, the integration. Um, so now let's let's think about it. If I want to, to go forward and do the integral on the alpha and alpha star functions, I'll need to specify boundary conditions for them. I, ha I have to think about how, uh, since we have two functions, I have to worry about the values of alpha at the points t and t prime, and about the value of alpha star on points t and t prime, because I'm integrating over these two functions. It's clear in the development I made, and they're not completely independent, but now it, it will become um, much more clear, even why I'm using this notation. You see, I'm going from alpha to alpha star. I could have written f of alpha, alpha star t prime, alpha, I, I don't know, some alpha prime here and, 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 and alpha alpha prime star t here, right? Uh, if you're wondering why I didn't specify two alphas here and two alphas there, now uh, I hope it will become clear. The point is, it is very tempting to specify each function at both points in time, right? But you cannot do that. And the reason is uh, that in quantum mechanics, right, the uncertainty, remember these are eigenvalues. These functions are eigenvalues of uh, the, the A and A dagger operators. Huh? And, and the uncertainty on, on the determination of any uh, value at any point in time is uh, limited by this relation. Mm -hmm. So this is quantum mechanics. Whatever state I'm, I'm considering, right? Uh, the precision with which I can set any value is limited at the same time, right? At the same point in time, is is uh, limited by the commutator between the operators, uh, which. Uh, that measurement is uh, corresponding to. So say I have an operator A and an operator B, the measurement, the simultaneous measurement of A and B is limited by this relation. So I can only completely determine two different observables that have commutator equal to zero, right? The thing is, uh, we know that A and A dagger do not commute. This is different from zero. And that means that I can never know alpha and alpha star with total precision at the same time. I cannot. I'm just violating uh, quantum mechanics, right? This is where uh, the famous relation between Q and, 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 and between position and momentum comes from, right? That means is bigger than h square over 2, right? 
So here we have the same thing. I cannot put boundary conditions that violate this because uh, it's just a problem for quantum mechanics. So I have to choose different boundary conditions. Hmm? So one of one choice that I could make, and then we'll see at the end if that's consistent, but it, it is a choice at this point, right? Was to choose to set one of the functions at one point in time, and then the other will be completely unknown. I mean, I'll make uh, the uncertainty on one of them zero. That means the other one is, has a huge uncertainty, has infinity. And, and of course, at the other end, because I have to solve equations for both, or the other one, and if I want any chance of knowing of a star, then I, I, I have to set do the opposite. And, and that's why I'm using this notation. So I'm saying I know alpha at the start. So for t, which is the starting time, I'll set alpha t equal alpha. So the, this is not the perfect notation, but when I'm not showing t, I'm actually talking about a constant. This is the function that depends on the time. And this is just a number that I choose at the start. And at t prime, I know alpha star. That I can do. Right? That that is not a problem. And this is fixed. Right? These two numbers are fixed. Right? That means that alpha star at time t, at the, this initial time t, is free. Right? Can be anything. That means sigma of for measurements of a dagger is it's, uh, not zero, it's infinity, and alpha at time t prime is also free. I don't know alpha at the final time. Why right? that means sigma of a is is infinity at this point in time. So those are the boundary conditions that I can use. And I mean, I could use uh, mixed boundary conditions, have some uncertainty here and some, but that's just making my life harder, right? This is uh, a much more well-defined uh, transition. And of course, then if I, I actually have mixed states at the start and the end, I can just do integrals with some... Uh, a wave packet at the end of the start. If I know every possible tr transition about definite states, then I can calculate any state. So that's the thing I need to calculate with these boundary conditions to know everything. Huh? So now I want to get to the um, equations of movement. Right? Let me just rewrite the action in two ways because that will help me. So I have the action here, right? The, my uh, propagator is written as uh, um, path integral of the exponential exponential of i something. So this something is uh, the action, right? Written here in terms of the Hamiltonian, but it, it, it is the, the that is the action. Right, which I'll call just S tilde for now, and um, because it's written in this way, and um, I want I, I, I this this is a useful form, but also I want to notice that I can write in a different form just by noticing that I can take the derivative. There's a time. This is alpha dot star here. There's a time derivative acting on alpha, and I can actually do the integration by parts and throw it out here, right? If I do that, uh, this part of the integral becomes uh, the integral. Let me just define this as s tilde, so everyone knows what I'm talking about. And then if I do the partial derivatives here, the, the integration by parts, then I get d tau. There's a minus sign that shows up here. 
of tau over i. The dot ends up here, alpha dot of tau. I'll just keep the Hamiltonian where it was. Okay. And then there's a total derivative on this part, which I can integrate and just it will be just alpha tau, alpha star of tau, calculated between points t prime and t. So this is the result of the integral. There's no funny business with throwing away boundary terms now. I'm keeping everything in place. It's it's right here. Right? So we've been careful to be rigorous about these now. And there's also this term that was the leftover term from before. So this is uh, my action here. Right? So I can calculate these at these two extremes. The lower extreme, of course, is just this, right? It's the same. Alpha star of t, alpha of t, but there's a minus sign because in this lower boundary. So it just uh, uh, conceals with, with this term. So this goes away when I, I take the lower limit. And of course, the upper limit stays here. That shows that that was a little bit odd because it seemed that like one of the limits had a, a symmetry here, right? There's a special term that only depended on, on the lower limit. But you see, I can, just by changing where I put the derivative, I, I also see that the other, the other term can appear here too. But it's not just that. It also makes easier to do the extreme extremization of the action. So now I want the movement, the equations of movement, right? And for that, I will extremize the action. So I have to impose that the variation of S tilde is zero, right? And that means I have to calculate the variation of alpha of tau delta s tilde delta alpha tau plus the variation of alpha star tau delta s tilde delta alpha star tau is also, uh, I mean, the, the sum, this is the total variation of uh, S tilde, this must be zero. And it is easier to use um, this expression to calculate this variation and this one to calculate this, right? Because the way I have alpha star here and alpha, the, the, the dot is on the other one and vice versa. So it's easier to use one form to calculate one of them and the other one to calculate the other. Right, so with that in mind, let me see if I can keep everything on the same screen. So the first one I'll do is that one, is delta S tilde, delta alpha tau, is so equal to just this term, alpha dot star. Again, I'll call this classical because I know when I solve this equation, I'll get the fixed function, the classical, because I'm doing a path integral now, right? So I'm, I'm going to through all the forms of alpha, all the forms of alpha star, but the form that satisfy the extremization of the action is the classical solution, right? So I'm calling this classical minus the variation of the Hamiltonian, which I'm not doing yet. Actually, by now it's just the partial derivative towards alpha classical of tau. This must be zero. Right? And this second part here, I can use this second form to, to calculate. So the variation of S in relation to alpha star tau 
is equal to minus here, right? Minus alpha dot classical tau i minus del h del alpha star classical tau. Right? So now, just remember that the Hamiltonian written in terms of these variables is just omega alpha star alpha, these all functions of time, right? Gamma alpha star minus, I'm not very good with these stars. Yeah, that's a better star. And, and gamma bar of alpha. Right, so I can do this partial derivatives and get the following two equations, which is um, just, yeah, let me just do the derivatives that will give me alpha dot star classical tau minus i omega alpha star classical, which just comes from this term, and I'm multiplying everything by i to get this i out of here, plus i gamma bar, coming from here, is equal to zero. And the other equation comes from here, alpha dot classical of tau plus i omega alpha classical minus i gamma equal to zero, well, which is quite a nice expression, kind of decouples alpha star from alpha, and I can solve for these two functions, right? Remembering that I have uh, some conditions that I use here, right? I used uh, to get this, um, which is the delta, oops, um, delta alpha star tau, tau equals to tau t prime is equal to zero, right, because I'm fixing alpha star at that point, and delta alpha tau at point tau equal t is also zero. So here, these are all functions that depend on tau. Let me put that explicitly to avoid confusion. So this is a function of tau. This is a function of tau. And just to be clear, these two conditions were needed because I also have this piece, right, when I'm doing the variation of S tilde in relation to these guys, I also have this piece, and the variation of these is zero on one edge and zero on another, so I can use those conditions to make this part go away and this part go away. That's why you don't see it here, right? Or here. So these two conditions are needed to get these two equations. Um, so now, I have to solve these equations with the conditions I set before, right? So, um, if you remember, I have that alpha of t, calculated the time t, t is the edge, right? I'm using tau for the time that runs. These are fixed times at the, the initial and the final time needs to be a constant alpha, and alpha star at t prime, which is the final time, needs to be a constant that which I'm calling alpha star. Hmm? So the solution to these equations, I will just write the solution. You can check by plugging the solution back in here and, and seeing that it solves the solution, is the following. So alpha classical of tau, is equal to alpha, the constant, 
uh, actually these, these these conditions are for the classical one exponential of i omega t minus tau plus i integral from t to tau of the exponential i omega s minus tau gamma of s ds s here is just the integration variable but it's it's a dimension of time right it's dimensions of time and the solution for alpha star classical of tau is alpha star exponential of i omega tau minus t prime plus i integral from tau to t prime exponential of i omega tau minus s gamma of s bar d s so these are the two sh two um, solutions let me box this and it's quite easy to to at least check that they satisfy the boundary conditions right if i put t here this exponential goes away the integral also goes away because these two limits are the same so this is zero and i get only alpha the same here for t prime i put three prime here i just get alpha star and checking that there are actual solutions to that in to, to the, the equations you have to actually go and and plug them in there and, and check right there i'll leave many uh, passages here as as exercises because we are already too long on this one right uh, so what do we want to do next right this is very similar to the situation we had with the um, path integral uh, for the forced oscillator before right? where I, I want to do a Gaussian integral now that I know the classical solutions right? I know that I can make a change of variables in the uh, generating functional and if I do it for instance this change of variables now I, I, I already know the solutions to the classical one right? and change the variable uh, the integration variable so now I'm integrating over the tilde variables both for alpha and alpha star hmm? One can show, and that will be an exercise, that I can rewrite S tilde of alpha t, alpha star t, gamma, gamma bar. That means the action in the presence of sources in terms of the extreme of the action in the minimum classical t in the presence of sources plus a quadratic variation as i distance myself from those that that minimum which is just s bar alpha tilde of t alpha tilde star of t in the absence of sources right that's the same i did before as i wrote the gaussian as a minimum which is the classical solution and a quantum fluctuation which is the quadratic going away from the source and and then if you remember well let me bring a reminder here once i did that before right i, I had a z of j 
which I wrote the action as the classical in the presence of source, plus the quantum fluctuations, which are what I'm actually integrating uh, in the path integral in the absence of source. Then this part is just a constant because it's just a number because it has no sources. And of course, later I will differentiate in the sources to get correlators. And I got this answer, right? Uh, and this knowing the classical solutions, which I know they are here, I can just write this exponential, right? Completely. In fact, there's a very convenient way of writing this. I don't need this reminder, reminder anymore. And I can show that this part right here can also be written in a very convenient way. S, and this will also be an exercise. So I'm, I'm going fast here, but these are calculations that would be very boring to do on a video and also you need you need to practice right so it's good to do it yourself so i'm writing here the classical as tilde hmm? actually there's this i is not as tilde but just here right and and you can show this right that you can this is just putting a Hamiltonian here and fixing. But then if you use the solutions that I show above, you can actually get here. So now these alphas are really the constants, not the functions depending on tau anymore. And you can show this expression, which looks a lot like one that we had before, namely this one right here. So remember, we, we could rewrite, let me go back up. Uh, I could rewrite the S classical in the presence of sources as just a constant, which is just uh, uh, what I have here. It has no depending, dependence on sources at all, right? And this is a solution, total absence of sources. This, which is the classical solutions, times this linear on the sources. See, I have two terms here, one for each source and one for each alpha and alpha star. And a term which was quadratic on the sources with something in the middle. This is quadratic on the source. And this something in the middle is starting to look a lot like what we have for the delta Feynman, right? The delta after the Feynman prescription, you see? It's, it's starting to show up here. Right? So let's let's keep on that track. But this is very analogous to that expression. If you don't remember this, go back in the video and take a look. Right? Uh, so now, uh, once I have this, of course, I can just write following uh, the same we had before. Right, the z tilde, this tilde is just because now I'm in this harmonic space, right, is uh, some normalization, which is the integral, the path integral of this part on the tilde variables, right, but does not depend on the sources, as I, as I just show. Right? times the exponential of the action of alpha classical, alpha star classical in the presence of sources, which goes out, goes out of the path integral because it does not depend on alpha tilde after I change the variables of, of, the, of the path integration. Hmm? And now let's let's uh, choose some initial and final states to be able to compare this with the previous result. I'm talking about the same system. I'm just using different variables to describe it. Right? Instead of using uh, position, I mean, I, I'm using this uh, 
this uh, harmonic phase space. So uh, let's think a little bit about it. So what is the final and the initial state? If I take alpha, the definition of alpha as the exponential of alpha a dagger acting on zero, right? then alpha equals zero means that the state alpha will be the vacuum. And alpha star equals zero will mean, right, just a complex, complex conjugate of this, or the definition of the alpha stars to the left will also mean that the final state is the vacuum. So I'm making that choice now. I, I just decide that I'm calculating a vacuum vacuum transition. So that constant that I left open from the start now is just zero, right? So I'm I'm maintaining my my uh, boundary conditions that I choose a while ago, but now I'm specifying those numbers. They will be zero, both of them. And now I have a physical interpretation for that. I am in the ground state for the harmonic oscillator at the start and at the end. Right? And then I take, of course, I take the time, the initial time, and the final time, t and t prime, Actually, yeah, the initial one, I'll take to minus infinity and the final time to plus infinity. You see, I have a lot of physical interpretation to what I'm doing now. I'm just saying that in the future, the oscillator is in the ground state and in the distant past, it's also in the ground state. That's all. It goes from at, at far away from when I am looking at it, it's just the ground state in both cases. And this uh, allows us to tackle uh, something that we have left undefined so far, right? Now that we have very well-defined boundary conditions, we can notice that we have left something undefined. So just for a second, let go, let's go back to the simpler uh, phase space for the harmonic oscillator. If you remember well, I have defined this object, what, what, which was the propagator, in terms of a path integral, right? I had this definition a while ago. And this object was well defined as a transition between these two uh, points. So it is implied here in the path integral that this goes from q of t, q of t, to q prime of t prime. Right? These are the two fixed points at the ends of the paths I'm varying, hmm? which is needed for a path integral. Right? The path integral, the answer for a path integral, is is really something that that there is a number, right? So it's not like primitive. The path integral in that sense is like a well-defined integral, right? With limits, with proper defined limits. Right? But in the case of Z, of the generating functional, right? I defined it uh, in order to generate the um, endpoint functions, the endpoint correlators, as also a path integral of the exponential of the action, but in the presence of sources. But this is not the important thing, the sources. The important thing is they I never bother specifying what are the, the fixed points at the end of this path integral in the case of the generating uh, functional, right? Just left it open. So that's why we've been struggling with boundary conditions. When we're trying to calculate this guy all along, we've 
uh, undefined edges here, undefined boundaries for this function. Right? What I'm trying to get at here, what we're moving towards, is that I'm arguing, and I'm, I'll, I'll uh, show here that that is actually the consistent thing to do, is that this guy is actually only well defined. I mean, the, the definition I want to, I'm improving its definition. Now I'm including in the definition the boundaries, right? Which are the ground state for the system for uh, infinite future and the ground state for the infinite past. So that's what I'm, I'm trying to argue here, that I should include these boundary conditions on the definition of Z. The Z tilde still don't have this, so now I can remove the tilde and, and, and properly fix the boundary conditions. In the presence of sources, of course, I'll indicate that sometimes like this, this is the absence of sources, this is the presence of sources, that these will fully specify Z in a way that the calculations are fully doable. So let's use this definition now. I can include this here. Right, so now Z is fully defined, including the, the, um, the initial and final states, and use this definition now to calculate Z according to the expression above, right? which is equivalent to imposing this condition. So this gives me the ground state in, in the past, this gives me the ground state in the future, right? And now I can use this expression that is on this green box here to calculate this guy, right? So I have, let's do this. So, so Z, this is for any boundary condition I'm specifying, but this constant stays here. Right? times the exponential of what is inside right? of this. So, if I'm setting alpha and alpha start to zero, this part goes away. This part goes away because alpha is zero. This part goes away because alpha star is zero. So, the, this whole first line here is just zero. I don't have to care about it. So I only have to care about this second part. Let me copy it from there. This is just minus half of this integral from t to t prime, the s, the integral from t to t prime, the s prime, Gamma is just, now I'm, I'm going back to the J notation to compare with the results we have before. So gamma is just J over the square root of two omega. Same for gamma bar. Remember gamma was the same as gamma bar. In this case, we're just carrying it around for later. So you see that much later we use this expression for fermions that this is and then gamma will be different from gamma bar. And I have the exponential of minus e i omega s prime minus s, which, of course, I can just write as n times the exponential of minus half j delta f j, where, where delta f must be this exponential, this minus half, I mean minus half is here, but it's just exponential over 2 omega, right? Delta f is equal to 1 over 2 omega exponential minus i 
omega of s minus s prime. And of course, the integrals on s and s prime are hidden in these scalar products here. So there, th this is, I want you to stop a little bit to take a look at this, because this is, is, is quite beautiful now. So first, I, get, I got the same delta phi, man, right? It's the same one we had before, but now I use no prescription, right? I just follow, uh, um, I mean, step by step, I make no extra assumptions, with the exception of one thing, which is specifying the boundary conditions. Right? And now we see that this is completely equivalent to that prescription I used before, but more physical. Right? Now I know what I, what I am calculating. So z of j is now also clearly defined as this. And in the case of the uh, har forced harmonic oscillator, I got that expression for it. Now I even know what is this constant, right? At least the definition of it, right? Which is, again with the red, which is just this expression calculated in the absence of sources. So this is the actually the transition amplitude of the system to stay in the ground state from the distant past into the distant future in the absence of sources. So you see it's just really a normalization of the system, right? I'm just normalizing the chance of the vacuum staying the vacuum in the absence of any external effects. Right? It's, it's really something that you should fix by normalization. And now let's compare the boundary conditions we're using here with the ones we used before, right? So now I didn't use any Feynman prescription. I just calculated a vacuum vacuum transition in distant times, right? Defining my z like that, which is consistent with the definition we had before, because I didn't include the boundary uh, conditions in the definition, it was missing that. Now I know which is the proper one to use. And let's look at the, at, at the, uh, at the boundary conditions. Now, what I'm saying here, uh, is that for t, t going to minus infinity, alpha t is zero, but alpha star is free. Can be anything. Remember that alpha star is the eigenvalue of a dagger which is the creation operator. So that's creating a relation that between the past, right? In the past, we only have creation operators acting. Creation. This is very vague, but I'll, uh, I'll improve it so. And uh, conversely, when I take t to plus infinity, alpha star of t is zero. And that means that alpha t is free. Again, since alpha t is the eigenvalue of a, right, I only have in the future, I only have the annihilation. So 
I only have the annihilation part in the future. Right? Now remember that I can write my position operator, which was one the one I'm deal I was dealing with uh, in the previous case, the one I did like hand wavingly right, with the Feynman prescription. I was using this guy, and this can be written as a dagger a exponential of i omega t plus a dagger exponential of i omega t right? and looking at these conditions now i see that when i calculate in the distant past the expectation value of this guy which is actually the function right that's what i was using for the classical function in the past right if i put these conditions here well, i'm saying that uh, a will act on this state and get zero but a dagger can be anything, can be this alpha star. That means I just have to substitute this in here, in here, right? Alpha star can be anything that will come from this guy. And I'll have, that's what I'm saying, only the creation part. Only this part will be, this will be zero. So only this part will be present. And I get alpha star, which is free, some number, right? over square root of 2 omega exponential of i omega t which is exactly the boundary condition i i imposed last time i, I call it just a exponential of i omega t right for the past and for the future i get the same idea right Now plus infinity. Now only the annihilation part will be present because alpha is free, but alpha star is zero. That means that part is zero. And I get alpha to omega exponential minus i omega t. Again, some constant times the negative exponential, which are the boundary conditions I used before. But now I know the physical meaning of them. Right? The physical meaning is that I'm projecting on the ground state. So I'm assuming I have the ground state in the past, I'm assuming I have the ground state in the future. That allows me to invert that operator. This is completely equivalent to the Feynman prescription. We will see this happening again and again. So this is the main thing uh, you should keep in mind. This is really important this prescription of going around the poles implies some projection for the future of, or the past of this of of the system on its ground state right you're assuming it comes from the ground state and it goes back to it right and that we'll see again and it is a, a worth keeping in mind and and it shows that you can do uh, uh, that uh, the thing we did with the prescription before in a cleaner way but of course then you have to deal with this harmonic phase space so the projection on the ground state was hidden on, on the uh, Feynman prescription I think this is all I wanted to say for today uh, see you next time